All right, folks, let's talk about what you'll need to study to be successful on your test on cell theory, cell structure, and cell function. In your VIP section, we have three sets of notes that would be helpful to study for this unit. You have your cold bowl about the cell theory scientists. You have your cell envelope with cell part flashcards inside. And you have your newest foldable about the differences and similarities between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. There's a little bit of organelle review on the back of that. You also might want to review from your, our labs and projects section, the intro to microscopes lab and the two cell labs that we did in class. Also useful perhaps would be your cell as a city analogy paper, which kind of breaks down in simpler terms what each of the organelles do in a plant and in an animal cell. And of course, as always, your portfolio and glossary will help you prepare for this test. On my website on Phoenix Student View Parent View, you'll be able to find full copies of all of our notes and class activities, as well as links to online review games, both of my own creation and other ones I found online, and links to this and other review movies. So in this unit, we learned all about the cell. We used compound light microscopes to look at various cell samples, both prepared and ones that we made ourselves, to observe cell structure. We learned the parts of a microscope, as well as how to troubleshoot using one. But none of our endeavors in class would have been possible without the work of scientists in the past paving the way with the invention of microscopes and the establishment of cell theory. Our story starts back in the 1590s-ish with a glasses maker's son named Zacharias Jansen, who, while playing around with some lenses in his dad's shop, helped create the first compound microscope. Next on the scene was a scientist named Robert Hooke. No one really knows what Robert Hooke looks like because no confirmed official likenesses or portraits of him exist today. However, it was Robert Hooke that first coined the term cells to describe what he saw under his microscope. Hooke was looking at a thin slice of cork under his microscope, and he described the little chambers that he saw as cells because they reminded him of little rooms where priests would live. The little cells or little rooms that he was seeing were probably the cell walls of these dead plant cells from the cork. The term cells stuck, and that's what we call them today, the basic building block of life. The first to see living cells was a scientist named Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who discovered protists and bacteria when he looked at, among other things, the gunk he scraped off of his own teeth. Scientists the world over continued to ponder life and explore it using microscopes, but it wasn't until the 1800s and a trio of scientists that cell theory was officially established. Matthias Schleiden was a botanist, or a plant scientist. He studied lots of plant tissues and came to the conclusion, based on his research, that all plants were made of one or more cells. He was kind of scientific pen pals with another scientist, a zoologist named Theodor Schwann. Schwann studied animals, and he said that all animals were made of one or more cells. They reached these conclusions at approximately the same time. Keep in mind that back in the 1830s, news traveled a lot more slowly than it does today, and all of their correspondence took place in the form of writing letters, not texts or emails. These two scientists agreed that the cell was the basic building block of life, and that all living things, to their knowledge, seemed to be composed of cells, but they disagreed about where new cells came from. Schwann believed that animals are composed of one or more cells. He also believed that cells come from other cells. Schleiden believed that plants were made of one or more cells, but disagreed with this idea that cells come from other cells, believing instead that cells spontaneously burst into life through a process called spontaneous generation. Arguing and debating continued for many years. It was not until the 1850s when a scientist named Rudolf Virchow came on the scene and settled the matter once and for all. He said that all cells come from other living pre-existing cells. Taken together, the findings of these three scientists create what we now know today to be called cell theory. The tenets of cell theory, or the parts of cell theory, are as follows. One, all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Two, the cell is the basic building block of life. 
and three, all cells come from living pre-existing cells. It is this third part that disproves what Schleiden believed. Schleiden believed in spontaneous generation, which we know is not true. All cells come from other living pre-existing cells. So now that we know the basics about cell theory, we can get to talking about the different kinds of cells. There are two kinds of cells that we learned about. We learned about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are simpler organisms that lack a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotes are much more complex. Eukaryotic cells contain specialized structures called organelles that help carry out specific cell processes. This complexity and structure allows for eukaryotic organisms to successfully be multicellular. Examples of eukaryotic organisms include animals, fungi, protists, and plants. The biggest difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is where the DNA is stored. You'll remember that DNA is like a blueprint for cell functioning. It dictates all of the actions of the cell. In eukaryotes, there's a true nucleus, whereas in prokaryotes, the DNA is in a tangled loop and there's no true nucleus. It might help you to remember that a prokaryote has no nucleus, whereas a eukaryote has a true nucleus. Let's talk a little bit more about a prokaryotic cell structure. The farthest outside layer of a prokaryotic cell is the capsule. The capsule is made of these long carbohydrate chains called polysaccharides that provide extra protection to the prokaryotic cell. The next layer down is the cell wall, a rigid structure that gives support to the cell. Inside the cell wall is the cell membrane, a semi-permeable barrier, meaning it lets some things through, that's made of phospholipids. The cell membrane decides what can come in the cell, what has to stay out, what has to leave, and what has to stay. Inside the capsule, the cell wall and the cell membrane is a jelly-like fluid called cytoplasm found inside of every cell. A prokaryotic cell doesn't have a nucleus. Its DNA just hangs out in the cytoplasm in a loop called a plasmid. The DNA tells the cell exactly what proteins to make and ribosomes, little protein factories inside the cell, help create these proteins. Now let's look at some eukaryotic cells. Let's look at plant cells and animal cells. Both plants and animals are always multicellular, but they differ in terms of their energy metabolism. Plants are autotrophs, meaning that they can make their own food, whereas animals are heterotrophs. They must eat other organisms for food. Plants are able to make their own food because they are producers. They can use a process called photosynthesis to harness energy from the sun and turn it into a usable form called glucose. In the presence of sunlight, carbon dioxide and water are turned into glucose sugar and oxygen. You don't need to know this chemical equation right now, but we will eventually learn all of the parts. This process is called photosynthesis. The outermost layer of structure in a plant cell is the cell wall. This provides some rigidity and support to the plant. Plant cells also have a cell membrane, that same semi-permeable phospholipid bilayer that we were introduced to when we were talking about prokaryotic cells. The cell membrane decides what has to leave and what can stay inside a cell. Like all cells, plant cells are full of cytoplasm, that jelly-like substance inside the cell that cushions the organelles. Plant cells are eukaryotic. They have a true nucleus, the control center of the cell, which contains the DNA. Inside the nucleus is a smaller structure known as the nucleolus. The nucleolus makes ribosomes. Ribosomes are found throughout the cell, sometimes stuck to a structure known as the endoplasmic reticulum. We'll get to that later. Ribosomes take amino acids and make them into proteins. Proteins are the lifeblood of the cell and the reason that the cell exists. Plant cells have a large vacuole, a storage space primarily used for water. The endoplasmic reticulum is attached to the nucleus. It makes lipids, processes poisons, and transports materials throughout the cell. When the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, has no ribosomes attached to it, it's said to be smooth. When ribosomes are attached, it's called rough endoplasmic reticulum. Plants do that awesome process of photosynthesis in the chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are organelles that are full of chlorophyll and are able to harness the sun's energy through the process of photosynthesis to store it later as glucose. When a plant cell needs to burn some of this glucose for energy to support its life processes, the glucose goes into the mitochondrion, plural mitochondria, where cellular respiration occurs. Cellular respiration is the exact opposite of photosynthesis. In cellular respiration, oxygen 
and glucose sugar are burned to create carbon dioxide, water, and ATP energy. ATP energy powers all the processes in the cell. The Golgi complex is a series of membranes within the cell that helps package and ship proteins. The little messenger pouches of proteins and other chemicals that are sent throughout the cell and to other cells are called vesicles. Lysosomes, which debatably exist in plant cells, are specialized vesicles full of digestive enzymes that help break down foreign invaders to the cell as well as worn out parts of the cell. Now let's talk about an animal cell. An animal cell does not have a cell wall, so its outermost layer is that semipermeable phospholipid bilayer known as the cell membrane. Within the animal cell is that jelly-like substance, the cytoplasm, cushioning every organelle, as well as the nucleus, which holds the DNA, and the nucleolus, which makes ribosomes, and ribosomes make proteins. Animal cells also have endoplasmic reticulum, both rough and smooth. They also have a Golgi complex that creates vesicles full of chemical substances to communicate with other cells. Animal cells also have vacuoles, but they are not nearly as big as the vacuoles found in a plant cell. Because all animals are heterotrophic, meaning that they cannot produce their own food and must consume other organisms for energy, they do not have chloroplasts. Animal cells then rely heavily on their mitochondria to break down glucose for energy to power life processes. Animal cells contain lysosomes, kind of like a cleanup crew, getting rid of invaders to the cell or broken parts of the cell. A unique structure that we learned about that's found only in animal cells is called the centriole pairs. Centrioles are organelles that are visible during cell division. They come in pairs and when the cell is ready to divide, one will go to each end of the cell, helping pull the animal cell apart to form two new cells. Now's the part where I'm going to review everything. Really, really fast. We learned about two main types of cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have everything happening in the cytoplasm. They do not have specialized organelles, nor do they have a true nucleus. You might remember that pro means no. Prokaryotes have no nucleus. Eukaryotes have a true nucleus. You might remember that you means true. A prokaryotic cell is much simpler than a eukaryotic cell. Its DNA is not in a nucleus, and it contains several layers of protection, the capsule, the cell wall, and the cell membrane, because it is always a unicellular organism. In terms of eukaryotic cells, we look specifically at the differences between plant and animal cells. Let's quickly run through some of the similarities and differences in their organelles. Plant cells have cell walls. Animal cells do not. Both plant animal cells have a cell membrane that kind of acts like a security guard of the cell, keeping out the bad stuff, keeping in the good stuff. Both cells have cytoplasm to cushion their organelles. Both kinds of cells have a nucleus, the control center holding the DNA, as well as a nucleolus, which makes ribosomes. A structure unique to the plant cell is the chloroplast, which can do photosynthesis. A structure unique to animal cells would be the centrioles, which help during cell division. Both cells have ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, that can either be rough with ribosomes attached or smooth without ribosomes attached. Both plant animal cells have vacuoles, but plant vacuoles are much larger than animal vacuoles. Both kinds of cells have mitochondria that do cellular respiration. Both have a Golgi complex that creates vesicles of proteins to send messages throughout the cell and to other cells. And both debatably have lysosomes, the cleanup crew that help digest intruders to the cell as well as broken cell parts. In this unit, we learned about cell theory. Zacharias Janssen made the first compound microscope. Robert Hooke coined the term cells. Anton van Leeuwenhoek was the first to see living cells. While Schleiden and Schwann studied multiple animal and plant tissues and concluded that all plant and all animal organisms are made of at least one cell. Their debate was finally settled when Rudolf Virchow came on the scene and said that all cells come from other living pre-existing cells. Taken together, these findings create the three tenets of cell theory. All organisms are composed of one or more cells. The cell is the basic building block of life. And all cells come from living pre-existing cells.